So good evening, everyone. We've got lots to cover this evening, so uh, perhaps we'll start on time. It's um, the first of AONM's roundtables, and we hope to have many more of these. We're delighted to welcome um, Professor Leona Gilbert, Dr. Sarah Myhill, Dr. Zaneta Misho, and Dr. Armin Schwarzbach. And um, you know all of us, our bios were on the website, so I won't uh, go through them and take up time. Let's just start immediately. Just to say, please do put any questions or comments you have in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll be looking at those and incorporating your um, questions as well, if we can. We'll only go on for about an hour. We won't extend this along beyond that today. Um, for Professor Gilbert in um, Finland, I think it's already two hours <laughs> later than it is here. But um, we do have some cases that were sent in in advance. So we'll begin with those. So I'll begin with um, the shorties, if that's all right. And then we'll go on to the longer ones. So um, one of the um, questions was, um, I have a 52-year-old patient who has been diagnosed with bronchiectasis and asthma. I would like some guidance on what infections or immune markers should be run. I will be doing a CD3 and CD57 cells and Coxsackie. I need guidance on other possible infections that would be appropriate. Now, saying CD3 and CD57 reminds me actually, uh, Leona, that you were going to give us a short presentation on exactly that topic and infections before we begin on the cases. So yes, I do thank apologize you. for having jumped the gun. Let's no. go on to your short uh, presentation first, and then we'll come back to that case. Great, thank you. So we thought that we would actually bring in some kind of evidence-based approach to looking at our cases, because I know that a lot of clinicians have a lot of experience with dealing with chronic cases, difficult cases, and I'm, I, I'm the one to say, let's publish, let's publish. So this is an example of a cohort of chronic Lyme disease patients coming from Ireland. It's a collaboration with UK doctors, as we can see here, some scientists, some medical students, and obviously professor and, and, uh, and Dr. John Lambert in UK. This is a great collaboration because what we did within this study, we took 301 patients um, that were diagnosed, of course, with chronic Lyme disease, we surveyed them over a period of time, and we surveyed them in regards to not only blood chemistries and blood work, but also with symptoms. And you can see in this panel here, bottom panel, we in regards to surveying them at baseline T0 and then two follow-up treatments, T1 and T, T2, these, these follow-up times, you can see that actually the severity, which is one, and, and feeling really great is number 10. On this sale, scale line, you, we can see that the symptoms are resolving during their treatment protocol. And this was a very easy way of actually assessing these 301 patients by just doing the surveying questions on, on a scale system like this, one to 10. And interesting enough, um, the treatment protocol that was used, that Jack used, Professor Jack Lampard used, was, was a combination of antibiotics. And this is a large cohort study, 301 patients, to demonstrate that different combinations of anti antibiotics uh, running between 12 weeks to 40 weeks actually resolved a lot of the patient or patient symptoms that they were experiencing. And this is an important study because it gives support that, uh, that uh, long-term treatment with antibiotics does indeed help. And we had uh, within this cohort only one patient that actually needed to be admitted to the hospital, but it wasn't really directly related to the treatment protocol this person was receiving. But was what was interesting though, in regards to these patients, when we looked at their CD57, so 60% of these patients had a low CD57. And then we isolated and wanted to know what kind of infections do they have? So Borrelia spirochete form, Borrelia round bodies or persistent form, Borrelia spirochete or brown body forms together, or Borrelia with friends or co-infections, 
or, or other tick-borne infections like Babesia. And you can see here in this bar graph that 60% of these patients um, were suffering, suffering from um, uh, round body, so the persistent form of Borrelia. And this is statistically relevant when we analyze these patients, but the point is, is that when, when we analyze the CD57 and we analyze what type of infections, we can really forecast these individuals have a, a suppressed immune system or a dysfunctional immune system. And we, and even further phenotyping these patients, we are seeing some patterns that we're going to report in a paper, hopefully being published this year. But the point is, is that we're seeing low CD, CD3 markers, low CD4 markers, low CD8 markers as well, and other CD markers that we're excited to, to mention in this paper. But I wanted to promote this evidence-based or the clinically based kind of perspective of your data on your patients and encourage you to to publish. We help clinicians establish a database on their patients so that we could mine it fairly easily and we could actually get a really good collaboration and, and, uh, and start publishing, giving an evidence-based approach to the treatments, to the markers, to the common features that you will see. So I really encourage you to come and contact us in this round table afterwards as well, and really try to think about setting up these databases so that we can mine, mine it and publish because we need more evidence-based uh, trials, clinical trials or clinical data. And this was just a, this was a retrospective audit of these 301 patients. And it was very easy to collect this data and to put it in an Excel sheet and mine it. So come talk to us about your, your patients and how we can help you establish your database. Leona, could we also cover natural therapies and not just a pharmaceutical? Yes, that's that's the point. So it, the point is no matter what, just get the data in a data in a database, like an easy format, like an Excel sheet. But the point is, is that you need to survey them before, during, and after treatments, of course. And you have this data in some form or another, a PDF or a charts or whatever, but it's very simple to get it into a database and have it structured so that we could mine it easily. Oh, fantastic. Well, perhaps we'll have a separate webinar all about that with um, yeah. some of what you've already done and the type of databases you're suggesting we use because it needs to be very standardized, doesn't it? It does because, because if we're missing data on one patient, unfortunately, we can't use that patient's data. So it has to be really standardized and we collect data, you know, a lot of data, a lot of the same data of the patients. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. Um, well, I'll go back to that um, case, just a shorty question really, though of course what lies behind it is much more complex. I have a 52 year old patient who's been diagnosed with bronchiectasis and asthma. I'd like some guidance on what infections or immune markers should be run. I'll be doing CD3 and CD57 cells and Coxsackie. She was hospitalized with hemophilus influenzae type B last year before the diagnosis and mycobacterium avium has been tested and found negative. Um, I need guidance on other possible infections that would be appropriate. By the way, we did say for this um, particular round table that we'll be focusing on infections and um, mycotoxins. So that's why there is this um, delineation in other round tables, we will extend beyond that. Sarah, thank you. Okay, well, as, as everybody knows, I'm more a clinical doctor, but I now have five patients with bronchiectasis who have been hugely improved by sniffing iodine. So these are the two bits of equipment that you need a salt pipe which is just a plastic tube um, with holes in the bottom and a mouthpiece um, uh, which is full of sea salt you might be able to hear that put a couple of drops of iodine in that in the mouthpiece i hope you can see that so one two like that and give it a little shake now iodine is volatile it contact kills all microbes there's no microbe that's resistant to iodine and if you sniff it uh, and, and rather than inhale it up the nose like that you can smell it if you can smell it, you have a therapeutic dose because it kills all microbes at 10 parts per million. And if you sniff it, 
It treats the whole of the upper airways, the sinuses, the pharynx, the bronchus, the, the larynx, the bronchus, the airways. And all these, these five patients I say that I have who have bronchiectasis, since doing my usual workup, which you're all aware of, you know, ketogenic diets and so on, and sniffing iodine, their need for antibiotics has dropped to zero. And the only time they've required antibiotics is if they've reneged on the regime, forgotten the salt pipe with the iodine. It really is a fabulous tool for any chronic obstructive airways disease. And also a great tool if you get um, acute infection, like you think you've got all the symptoms of a cold or an upper respiratory infection. If you sniff iodine, it massively reduces the, it, the loading dose of whatever virus, bacteria or fungus that there may be. So it's a great tool, very cheap. Everyone can use it. Thank you, Sarah. One um attendee has just asked, does sniffing iodine cause bleeding? No, on the contrary. Most nosebleeds are caused by low-grade staphylococcal infections in the nose, uh, tip, tip, and, and that which may well be an MRSA, and iodine gets rid of that. That kills that microbes and toughens up the lining of the vessels. So no problem with nosebleeds. Super, thank you. I, I, Armin and um, Dr. Zaneta, I think that this was uh, partially yes, um, aimed at you that. as well, because um, this therapist is thinking of um, any it's, infections that could uh, underlie I thought immediately these. about chlamydia and mycoplasma pneumonia. The first, um, the question, mucosal infections. This is typical mucosal infection. I thought about parasites because maybe allergic asthma. I thought about yeast and mold and mycotoxins, so the environment also. Um, the viruses, the viruses also important. Yeah. Um, so the question, Coxsackie, is a good idea. Streptococcus, what you mm -hmm. mentioned, Sarah, Staphylococcus, we see also very common. And in most of this, there's a gut problem. Yeah, so the problem. natural yeah. problem, uh, the natural immunity in the gut is also mucosal infection there. And Janetta has some ideas. Um, the first idea is um, you check, please, the leaky gut in the gut and it's uh, very, very important and can protect him for inflammation in the gut. And um, uh, it's very, very important and for the check the histamine intolerance. Histamine. Yes. And, and would you uh, check that... diamine oxidase then? Um, or histamine in the stool? Diamine no. oxidase is very important. Oxidase. But, mm -hmm. um, Every exercise in the stool test is much better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's super. Well, I think those are some initial ideas there. Very, very helpful. Um, uh, may, maybe I could add something. I forgot the biofilms. Of course. Yeah. Um, because there's a huge point now, Sarah. I think you could also say something, Leona. We know a lot of these pathogens, chlamydia, mycoplasma, biofilm producers. So, and the question of the smokers, non-smokers, inhalation, whatever the people doing, electro smog, smog around us, uh, toxic environment. Uh, but the biofilms, maybe this could be an issue and some ideas uh, in this group. Well, yes, um, what, what, ahead, what, what works very well for biofilm is, is using DMSO. But the trouble with DMSO is it does make you pong. Uh, so the patients don't like it, but um, uh, DMSO is almost a universal solvent. It goes straight through skin um, and anything that um, uh, is, is contained within the DMSO will um, uh, be swept through the skin as well. And I just have just a quick, very quick case history. Friend of mine, her husband had neuroborreliosis. They're farming sheep farmers in mid Wales. She had an acute arthritis of her wrist um, which um, resolved completely with doxycycline, and she's quite sure it was that was a, a Lyme thing. But she's keeping it at bay by just applying, mixing doxycycline with DMSO and just painting it onto the wrist. Uh, so the DMSO is carrying the doxycycline into the wrist um, to keep the arthritis at bay, and that is working very well. It's just an illustration of how useful DMSO is clinically. How fascinating that you can do that with an antibiotic. You can do it with anything. You can dissolve anything in DMSO. You can put ID in it. You can put vitamin C in it, and it, it um, um, uh, as I say, it 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 carries whatever that's through the skin, you know, like a knife through butter. It really is a very useful clinical tool. Oh, thank you. Um, this came up today with the therapist who I was speaking to. Um, Armin, I think this is targeted at you initially, which is that um. A second test. I'll tell you about the first one in a moment. Came up with Borrelia 
negative on the Elias spot. It was a one, a zero, and a zero. But it said at the bottom of that, there is a sign for possible virus infection in the Elias spot positive control. And the therapist asked me, how exactly is that done? And how can you know that when you do a test for a bacteria like Borrelia, that there might be a virus? There, there's a general, we name it a POC, which control in the test for your general vitality of your T cells, mm. okay? This is the Th1 immune system. So we see a lot of these patients with Th1 suppression, which means also vitality problems. So um, we do quantification, as you mentioned already, with the CD3 cells, the marker CD4, CD8, whatever you want to do. But what we see also vitality problem. Why is it, is it a vitality problem? Um, because they cannot release the interferon gamma any longer because they've switched to Th2. Um, this is the point, then you have a Th2 disbalance to Th1. So in the begin beginning of all infections, you have interferon gamma release, Th1 dominance. But later on, you produce your antibodies, Th2, interleukin 2, interleukin 1, 6, whatever you measure there for Th2. And these patients, um, what we have seen, they nearly all have um, additional virus infections, which suppress the TH1 system after a while. It's not in the beginning. We name it opportunistic infection, as it is in the uh, long COVID, post COVID now, with EBV, CMV, Coxsackie, Echo, whatever, HSC, herpes simplex, varicella zoster. They suppress and the Th1 system, and therefore they cannot produce interferon gamma. So it's always good, in my opinion, to show positive Elis spot than to show a negative Elis spot with this comment on it. That's very interesting. Can I give you a bit more information on that patient? And maybe we can just give a few clinical tips to the therapist. It's an 11 year old boy. Um, when he was seven, he was taken to the GP with constant swollen glands. He had an ultrasound and it was found that he did have swollen lymph nodes and low white cell count. He uh, has mouth ulcers, uh, enlarged lymph nodes, and um, still at the age of 10 had low white cell count and neutrophils. Um, an Armin panel was done in 22, and um, he was found to have Coxsackie and latent EBV, though he had zero lytic, he had a 15 for the latent. His stool test was clear. Um, he was given treatment and three months later he was improved, but um, this summer he was bitten by a tick and a pig. The tick was only on for 12 hours or less than 12 hours, but GI issues started stomach pain, fatigue and nosebleeds. So the clinician has done some tests. The EBV has come down from 0, 18 to um, um, uh, zero five, and um, the um, Borrelia, which was suspected because of the tick bite, came up as a zero on the Ellie spot. The Coxsackie wasn't retested, but before it was a thousand, a thousand, ten, and a thousand. You know what I mean there. The um, IgA was also positive. So otherwise, it was a rather flat interferon gamma release on both tests including this recent one where there was almost no interferon gamma release at all, but the CD3, CD57 cells, as you've just alluded to, were interesting. The CD57 was 52, where it should be above 130, and the CD3 was also on the low side at 1,400. So um, do you have any comments on that? And um, the therapist uh, did point out that the HSV was a two and a two. So even though that's weak, if he's overall got a bit of a flat, uh, you know, interferon gamma release at the moment, then a two could be a bit more than that, couldn't it? So any comments on that, Armin, before we sort of open it up to the team? This is the 3i model also from Jack Lambert and ourselves. So we always say if a pathogen, maybe it's Borrelia burgdorferi penetrating the body, it suppresses your immune system. And by that, um, you have inflammation. Inflammation is going up. And by this mechanism, you have reactivation. 
So we see uh, a lot of these Coxsackie reactivations, herpes simplex, varicella zoster. So especially the viruses play a role, but also parasites, yeast mold, the whole bunch of these pathogens is flowing up. So that's very typical story, uh, TH1 suppression and uh, more TH2. The gut plays a role for sure in the, this patient. Mention that natural immunity is going down. So more, so that that means that the infection was still there. We name it silent carrier. So oh, the okay. people carry that, but they're not so symptomatic. They feel pretty well. And this is a story with a 3i model, infection, immune, uh, suppression and inflammation and we see in all of this patient that and also Sarah maybe you could say something how to do therapy now yes how to treat the, the, and gender, uh, these the, patients yes the, yeah. the therapist did specifically ask since he's had suppressed immunity since the age of seven and that was when it was detected maybe earlier and he still has low on your test here Armin low neutrophils at only 39 you know where they should be a much higher percentage and other indicators like leukocytes also, the yeah. white blood cells, still far below 4.5. It is the virus, the virus, you know, um, underlying. And mm. we, we have it oh. chronic. And the problem is if you use antibiotics now, what happens? Immune suppression, more viruses. So in, in this, um, I would not treat, although there was a tick bite, I would first check the viruses as the doctor did and then do immune support, anti-inflammatory, what you are doing, what the therapy Well, well she, she's for. wondering what a, a really hard-hitting sort of immune support could be, because she's done a lot, and it's been successful so far, but obviously more is needed. Any suggestions on further really effective ways of raising the TH1? Sarah, you look as though you're about to say something, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, well, you know, my view, I mean, it's, I think it's absolutely shocking that we're seeing so many young people getting viral infections like shingles, um, like um, Epstein-Barr virus, when they really should not. Their immune system should be sufficiently robust to keep these at bay. And I think that's a reflection of the general immune suppression we're seeing throughout the population, but, but, but especially so in young people. And much of that has to do with very poor quality diets because my experience is most young people are complete sugar and carbohydrate addicts. Now, sugar and carbohydrates feed all infections. We know that because diabetics are much more prone to get these infections. And we're seeing type two diabetes in teenagers these days. So to improve the immune system, there is no one single intervention you can do. There is, you know, I'd love to be able to say, oh yeah, give this herb and, and everything. Well, it's just not like that. It's like getting your immune system right is like building a house. And the foundation stones of that house is a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Uh, and then you clean up the environment um, um, uh, by reducing uh, detoxing. Then you improve micronutrient status with uh, nutritional supplements, particularly vitamin C and iodine. So you have to build up the immune system and give, thereby, so give the um, immune system the energy to function and the raw materials um, with which it can uh, fight infection. Of course, vitamin C is going to come and zinc is going to come at the top of that list. And then we put in place interventions to reduce the infectious load because um, this, 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 this patient is going to have a whole host. We know it about Epstein virus, possibly Coxsackie, maybe other infections as well. And anything to reduce the infectious load is going to be helpful. Of course, vitamin C and iodine it will be at the top of my list, but um, methylene blue, I think, is going to be very helpful. Um, I mean, methylene blue, I'm just reading off my handout now, has um, um, inactive, uh, well, is um, inactivates viral nucleic acid of hepatitis C, HIV, Zika, Ebola, West Nile, Middle East Respiratory um, Syndrome, um, most of the herpes viruses, including EBV, CMV, varicella zoster, you know, it has broad spectrum antiviral activity. And um, so it's going to help to reduce the total load. And that will then take the work off the immune system. So it can then concentrate its fire, you know, where it is, where it is needed. And for some people, microimmunotherapy further helps that. So that's the kind of overall strategy um, um, uh, for the for the general treatment of almost any infectious disease. Is is methylene blue um, safe in children? 
Oh, it's joyfully safe. Um, uh, it can, uh, I mean, I usually recommend up to about two milligrams per kilogram of body weight, but it has been given intravenously at seven milligrams per kilogram of body weight with no side effects and no complications. It's a joyously safe, um, um, well, I suppose we call it a drug. It was actually the first drug that was described initially used to treat malaria to great effect. Yeah, yeah. It's a very um, good donor and acceptor of electrons, and that makes it very important for mitochondrial function. Right. One um, attendee says methylene blue is not available anywhere unless I've missed something. Do you feel able to mention a little tip there, yeah, yeah, Sarah? Well, yeah, the key is to get pharmaceutical grade methylene blue, BP73. And I've now found a, a source of it. And the joy is it's gloriously cheap. So 10 grams of of this of, of methylene blue costs about 15 quid, and that's three months treatment at, as, a, as a good dose. So it's a very inexpensive treatment. The only bore it, it is bright blue. And if you drink it just as a methylene blue solution, you know, you'll, you'll end up with blue teeth and a blue tongue. So the key to that is put in about um, to your daily dose of methylene blue, add about three grams of vitamin C. And that slowly converts it to leucomethylene blue. And in the body, methylene blue switches between methylene blue and leucomethylene blue as it accepts and donates electrons. So that makes it very palatable. You don't get stained teeth with it um, and uh, very tolerate, well tolerated by patients. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, let's go on to another case. We're just attempting to give sort of tips here and not sort of deal with the entire case. I'll share the screen on this one. Let me know if um, you're able to see it. Is that OK? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a 17 um, year old female, psychotic type symptoms and anxiety, ASD likely diagnosis in the background. It was discovered that living in an old farmhouse was moldy and um, mycotox results are here. We'll look at them in a moment. Over a year between 20 and 21, she slowly improved, but there has been a regression or at least appears to have been based on the results. So we'll just have a look at that now. So I'll go first to the results that were obtained in 2021. So these are Great Plains laboratory results. Um, which are done in urine, and um, mycophenolic acid was high, roridine E, verucarin, ocrotoxin, interestingly, was not above range at that time, and um, nor was citronin, uh, even though the moldy house had been sort of, the, the mold had been detected in the house. And then we went on to 22, where ocrotoxin, even though therapy had already started, Ocrotoxin was suddenly raised, but the other ones had gone. As far as I can tell, I hope I'm showing them all here. Yes, so this would be considered to be, uh, you know, by some interpretations would be considered to be good because they're not evident in the test. But then in 2023, which is the most recent test, and here the um, um, therapist is saying, well, you know, where do we go now? Because it seems to have recurred the patient is showing up with aflatoxin, ocrotoxin, sterigmatocystine, mycophenolic acid, and high citronin. Nothing else there, I don't think, no. But um, that's, that's a good handful. So um, let me just see whether there was any other text that was um, useful. Obviously, this is just a snippet from the case. Yes, there were also gut issues showing in 2022, I won't read it all out, but we do have some commensal imbalanced uh, flora. That's the yellow here on this doctor's data stool test. Interestingly, with quite a lot of streptococcus uh, at three plus. And in 2023, this is um, while therapy is still ongoing, um, streptococcus still appears to be the same, but a lot of the markers here have come down. Now, I'll enlarge the screen a little so that you can see them better on the left, because um, they're very interesting, that the um, secretory IgA was almost non-existent. Lactoferrin, 10 times the upper, the lower reference range. Calprotectin, very high. Lysozyme, very high. And um, 
other markers haven't been disclosed to us, but here we can see that those have been resolved pretty much. So we've still got the um, imbalanced flora up here. And the question was by the therapist, um, we've done all of this here, far infrared sauna, lots of um, sweating, HEPA air filters. We've refurbished the house, glutathione, biotoxin binder, humic and fulvic, fulvic acid work on the gut. So huge progress. But um, the 2023 mycotoxin tests suggest that more work is needed. They're worrying results. And so the question that came up later was, why a recurrence? What to do next? So I won't show the mother's results. They just backed up further release of toxins. But um, let me go back to everybody here. Maybe, Leona, you have a little bit to say about the mycotoxin test because that's your specialty. Yeah, for the toxiplex it is, um, not for the mass spec uh, results that you demonstrated. But um, I think the urine test for microtoxins is an indication, of course, but uh, that microtoxins are present in the system. But but you would expect to see higher mic microtoxin levels when you're shedding. So if treatment's working, if that's what you want to, you're going to see shedding, and you should see shedding shedding of microtoxins. Um, however, uh, there's half life of these microtoxins. Okay, from minutes to 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 hours, and even for some of them, days. So, so I wouldn't wait. If you want to see success of treatment, I would, I would definitely wait for those half lives and look at them and follow it. Not six months later, or not. I'm not sure the time between the testing, because you had the years 2022 and 2023. I believe. I suspect it's about a year. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't wait so long that way. But, but what you're probably seeing is 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 shedding and and of course you need to correlate that with the symptoms obviously you have to but uh, something that's uh, very difficult with urine tests and this applies to all urine tests it's you need to normalize uh the the marker that you're looking for you know because urine taken in the morning urine in the afternoon and urine in the evening is different and and usually and I'm not sure if these urine tests are are normalizing through creatinine levels because that's normally the norm, but still, still that normalizing through creatinine levels is not necessarily a marker for metabolism, and it's maybe not necessarily the best marker for uh, normalizing microtoxins. So, so we have to just be careful in regards to that. And and um, yeah, but I, I really think that you should be testing closer to treatment times, especially closer to the half-life of the microtoxin, and you shouldn't wait too late. How can we late. find out the half-life of each of the microtoxins? Oh, it's it's quite easy to, you know, Google search. It's like orcrotoxin is 35 days. That's maybe the longest. You, maybe you can produce a, together with the, the yeah. you know, mycotoxin make... test that we have of yours anyway. Maybe you could produce a short leaflet on that. That would be fascinating. I I will. I'll absolutely do the half-life of the, of the microtoxins. Mycotoxins. I'm running these down. So yes. Oh, wonderful. but I, but I think it's really great that you, but you see your common attributes with these individuals. They're having gut issues, then you treat it and then you're seeing shedding. Okay. And, and you should be seeing shedding in the, also in the Sarah and also sh shedding in the urine, but, but again, the, the normalization of the urine samples are, are a little bit difficult because you need to standardize it. So, so that's, the, that's kind of like the difficulty with using urine tests. Yeah. Could, could I just read out a comment by a great specialist here in the chat? Um, we know that he, he's very, very, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's been doing this all his life uh, professionally. He says the property requires decontamination, including actinose. Um, from both air and surface. Um, HEPA air cleaners are almost worthless. So that's interesting, isn't it? Um, that does suggest that um, maybe, a, you know, bringing in, which has probably also been done, actually. We haven't got the full, um, you know, background here. But, yeah. um, you know, doing testing of, of the dust, you know, collecting it from corners and so on is all very, very useful. Um, another therapist writes here, this is a huge problem with council houses in the UK, 
no one in authority wants to know and the poor patient is unable to move. Um, yeah. One point that occurred to me was because of the um, both streptococcus and um, staph showing up in the um, stool tests. Um, I do know from American specialists, uh, we were just talking about that this weekend. I, I was at the um, Thinking Autism Conference and we had a presentation there on pans pandas and the discussion was whether um, stool samples can show, if they show up staph, whether that's an indication of possible pans pandas as well, which means autoimmune neuropsychiatric syndrome associated mm. with staphylococcus or streptococcus. And um, that does appear to definitely be the case. There are correlations. So maybe because of the um, psychosis that was mentioned at the beginning, that was a clue for me. It could be worth looking into um, that kind of autoimmune activity that you can pick up even with preclinical tests like azot, that's anti-streptolysin and anti-DNAs B. Though, of course, we do have the Cunningham panel as well and other tests. Did you want to say anything? Um, you were nodding there, uh, Zaneta. Did you have any thoughts on further, uh, you know, thinking around that case? I think it's Bartonella, and um, it's better to check that in the blood test. Checking Bartonella? Yes. What gives you that idea? Um, the kind of design. It's in Europe's psychiatric part. Yeah. We know that the cats, the Bartonella, cats, the dogs play a massive role. Okay. In this. Uh, so I had the same thoughts, not just to think about mycotoxins. It's a triggering factor, you know, yeah. and a test is a test. Mm -hmm. The patient feels better. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, more. It's, yeah. it's not just the mycotoxins. It's not just the exposure. It's a complexity, inflammation, immune dysfunction, all of that. And we have infections. We have toxocariasis, this ex an example of the dogs. You need to uh, check the for parasites. cats in the house, mm -hmm. the parasitical part. Babesia with the sweats in this infrared uh, cabin. I thought about babesiosis immediately from infectious diseases. So I think the story is also broader. And also we have uh, to think about Aspergillus. Yeah. Um, Aspergillus is not, was not in this stool. So I, I, I need information yeah. more about that. You know, some information are missing. And what Leona, you have this uh, Toxiplex test. I think that makes sense also to do the main uh, uh, mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. And then um, a patient will feel or come to better solutions. It, it's not just the mycotoxins in mm. this case. Sarah, yes, go ahead. Just, just a couple of clinical points, because I struggle with diagnosing fungal or mycotoxin um, issues. And a very useful test is to see is to send the or ask the patient to go on holiday to a hot, dry climate for at least <laughs> two weeks. And if they are substantially improved as a result of that, then that's a very useful clue. Um, it may be or even a skiing holiday, because above 3000 feet, the air is too thin to support the moisture that these, mm. these fungi need. So if you're um, if you're if you feel much better on a skiing holiday or in a hot, dry or a cold, dry climate or right on the coast, right on the coast where the winds are on shore for moles and fungi can't grow on salty water. That gives you a clinical clue. The other uh, little uh, clinical that came out of this is um, some of you may know Dr. Rachel Brown, who's a consultant psychiatrist working uh, in the NHS in Edinburgh, uh, starting, she wants to do independent practice, but she is a great advocate of the carnivore diet. She herself has been eating carnivore for the last four years. And that is the starting point for all her patients with psychosis, um, um, uh, manic depression, uh, anxiety. But a carnivore diet is a very good for the brain. And I think this ties in with work by a Japanese researcher called Nishihara, who's demonstrated that people who have a fermenting upper fermenting gut, they also have a fermenting brain with the potential of those microbes in the brain to ferment neurotransmitters into LSD and amphetamine like substances. And that, of course, would explain the psychosis. Oh, wow. so, the, so the treatment for that is was how Dr. Dr. Brown would suggest would be a carnivore diet would be a great start. Fascinating. Thank you. I, I think we'll leave it there now on that particular case. We can always sort of include mycotoxins next time as well. Um, I'll just go on to the next one here, which is um, a patient who only got a two on the outer surface protein mix for Borrelia in August. 
um, was suspicious that that wasn't uh, really showing the full picture. And she retested and got a positive on the tickplex markers. And this is just recent, like a week ago, mm -hmm. on all of them. High positives, not just weak on IgG and IgM on mm -hmm. both the um, spiral sheet form and the round bodies. So I'll give you a bit more detail in a moment, but the first question is, um, should she suspect um, active infection and send the patient straight to the GP for doxycycline? Uh, Oops, I think she's... She was stuck. Frozen. Jillian is frozen. Yeah, and Jillian's frozen. <laughs> but Lena, you could answer. Yeah. So TickPlex basic um, test for the persistent forms of Borrelia against three different Borrelia species. And uh, TickPlex basic also tests for the spiricate form. So, so the normal parent form of the three species as well it's within within the samples okay and and the point is is that if they are positive yeah Jillian will come back but if they are positive for IgM and IgG this is this is a indication that they are how do I say we call them universal positive so it doesn't matter what sero serological tests that will be conducted, they will get, they will be positive because they're hypersensitive at, at the moment when their blood drawn was taken. Hypersensitive, okay? And and their hypersensitivity or this universal positives, we're seeing 3% of, of all chronic Lyme disease patients and Lyme disease patients, 3% um, of these patients turn to be these, these universal positive patients for IgM antibody. And we see 1.5% of these patients for IgG antibody. So, so there is a correlation that we are seeing. And I want your data too, so that we could publish this and support these percentages. But what we're seeing with these hypersensitive people is they're, they're actually establishing an autoimmune condition. Okay. And, and that is the point that their, their immune system is overreactive and, and we need to calm that down and we need to address that. So, so what we tend to do is, and it's really good to pick out these people, these universal positive people, because you can, you absolutely can spin down the IgM. Okay. Um, immune complexes, you can, and you can see the underlying kind of picture, picture of this. I started answering the question so about tickplex, Jillian, but but you can spin down a lot of these immune complexes, okay? And remember, immune complexes are not supposed to be supposed to be so abundant in the system to affect these tests because these tests take this take these kind of immune complexes in in a healthy control, uh, you know, as to to establish you know those baselines, okay, results that we get. So. So if you really are seeing this, this is these are interesting people, and autoimmunity uh, progression is happening. They're hypersensitive, and no one's publishing on this. This is why we need to publish this, guys. So it's <laughs> really important to give me these patients' data, and let's oh, publish you. together. Together, because if it is Tickplex plus results, okay. And remember, we have like 15 different antigens. Okay, we have co-infections and opportunist infections. These are very interesting people too, because it doesn't matter what serology tests, they will be positive. And we need to address them and treat them differently compared to weak positive, because we are seeing also weak positive patients and also no, no, uh, uh, no antibody response individuals as well. And these are really the sick, sick, sick people. So we have hypersensitive people, okay, with the overreactive immune system. We can see, of course, the normal, you know, um, the normal serology, because guys, this is immune system. You know, Borrelia isn't exceptional. It follows the, the you know, the normal immune system, except for we are seeing these exceptional patients where they have 
where they have these hypersensitivities or they have universal positives. And we're also seeing weakly positive because their immune is dysfunction. They can't produce an antibody response, okay? And we're also seeing weak, weak response. But if you correlate these two symptoms, it tells you the type of type of patient, uh, uh, patient that you have. And also if you correlate with the CD markers, especially the CD57 markers and the CD3, absolutely CD4, right CD8. There. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. The um, CD57 I have here from one of the tests was um, 19. Yeah. CD57. And the CD3 also was 620, where the minimum reference range is 900. Yes, 2600. And the patient's immune system is clearly on the floor because her neutrophils are only showing 20%, whereas her mm -hmm. lymphocytes are 53%. So it's completely skewed. You know, exactly. It should be very different. And so um, I'll just try and summarize what the um, therapist did particularly ask, which is, mm -hmm. um, should she, in view of the toxaki that's just come up for the patient, um, which is a hundred, a thousand, a hundred, a hundred. In other words, IgA over a hundred for both of them, where the titer should be below ten. Um, despite the tickplex, which has come up positive across the board, should she focus on viral um, treatment first, or should she go for if she's not going to take the patient to the doctor and ask for antibiotics, which I didn't hear, but we'll listen to the recording. So please don't go over that again. Um, or, or should she use a therapy? Uh, she will primarily want to use natural therapies, I think, that is um, able to target both bacteria and viruses. Do we have any idea from this yet? What would be best or do we need lots more information this is, this is a daily job we are doing um the point is it's a gut virus okay mm -hmm. okay so these patients have mitochondrial pathies because sucking away the atp all of them they have gut issues food intolerances leaky gut histamine whatever so you need to treat the gut if you use antibiotics you destroy the gut you provoke against again more the viruses not good um, also, uh, Leonor, what you mentioned, very, very, very important, we get coagulopathies from that, okay? IgM is a huge molecule, a huge molecule, yeah. huge protein, it's full in the blood. Uh, there's a problem with the blood perfusion. There's also mm. oxygen, th uh, oxygen, oxygen therapies, ozone therapies, okay? These people, they have cold hands, cold fingers. They have also the, this, what is it named, these uh, microclots. We see exactly in the long COVID yeah. stories, okay? Mm -hmm. So some doing aphrases successfully because the blood is a, a dirty sludge. Um, you cannot uh, bring the oxygen to the cells. You have concentration, mm -hmm. memory folks. Uh, I, I, you're completely correct. The TH1 system has break, is broken down. Now we have IgM, IgA. This is uh, not to say worst case scenario, but we need to reduce that. Uh, uh, otherwise, the autoimmune disorder is there, and then we have the next problem. Yeah. Um, please, the gut, uh, I think, plays uh, Jeanette an yeah. important role with the yeah. ozone therapy. Uh, what the gut need. is number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the home for bacteria and virus is in the gut. Okay. And this is very, very important. Particularly with the enteroviruses, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah, sure she's got echo virus, well. virus, echo virus, uh, echo virus every. Uh, Yersinia, Campylobacter. Yersinia, Campylobacter, Helicobacter. Cytomegalovirus, we have a lot of these food intolerances. And the candida in the gut. and Yeast, mold okay. in the gut, everything's full. Immunity, destroyed. 80% immunity, I think Sarah, that's correct, is yes, in the gut. So it's destroyed. Now we need Sarah for therapy options. What to do? <laughs> You're mm -hmm. looking for her in the back. We need solutions now. What to do? Yeah. And uh, this is um, one uh, number one problem in treatment for every every doctors. It's not good the uh, virus infection and bacteria infection and they give antibiotics. It's not it's good. good. It's not mm -hmm. good. But the immune system is go gone down, yeah. down and um, the candida is reactivated in the gut and the patient is uh, uh, tired, tired, tired. It's um, the big problem. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And this, the first is nutrition, 
plan the fashion. It's very important. The nutrition, change the nutrition, no histamine. Uh, eat um, the kitchen. It's very, very important. Vegetable and uh, um, drink water to um, maybe three liter in the day and tea. This is very, very important. And um, for me, it's um, no, uh, check the hormone, 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 hormone in the blood. Hormones. Yeah. yeah, but um, serotonin is very low. Yeah, and the patient no sleep is problem. Psychiatric sleep, depression, depression yeah. is and vitamin D uh, B three and K two. It's very very important. Mm -hmm. By virus infection, is the vitamin D D three mm -hmm. very low. Mm -hmm. So, it's very complex you. and it's very individual treatment. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you very, very much. I think the primary concern of that therapist, um, uh, who's a very, very long term, very experienced one, so she will have some ideas for exactly those points. But her prime concern was the tickplex. There's a question. Um, IgM, mm -hmm. which, which you discussed while, unfortunately, my internet went down. Yeah, but yes. I know that we've got the answers there. Sorry. Yeah. Um, there, yeah. you know, there's a question in the chat. So you can see two gram daily valaciclovir help reduce the viral load. This is an interesting question. If in the end we could use virus statics, and there are some studies about it for sure. Mm. So they're helpful also in, in Parkinson's as an example. All of these viruses are neurotropic, so they inflame your brain. Mm. They make multiple sclerosis like symptoms. They make yeah. depression, they make uh, Alzheimer's. So you have a whole bunch also in the brain. And this is a good point. Maybe we should try also virostatics. Yeah, I, I know Sarah, you um, have got long experience of using valcyclovir, valgancyclovir. Is that something you would consider in certain cases? or only when the load is high i've not i've never used valgancyclovir because that's a much more toxic thing but yes i have certainly used uh, valacyclovir uh, and i base that on the work of dr martin lerner uh, now he, him, he has he's published many papers um looking at uh valacyclovir in the treatment of fatigue and four in particular if you go to my website and google um uh, martin lerner valacyclovir you can see i've put links there to all of his papers um, and he got very good results in treating patients who had long-term Epstein-Barr virus infection. Uh, and uh, the treatments uh, was a val uh, valacyclovir, um, one gram three times daily. If you're much over 12 stone, then maybe four grams a day. Uh, you have to check liver function tests every month because you can get um, uh, um, um, uh, liver abnormalities and, and, and renal function tests uh, every month, particularly creatinine. But I have, having said that, I've never seen a high creatinine. Not that I've treated hundreds, mm -hmm. but certainly tens of patients with uh, valacyclovir. So it does seem to be remarkably well tolerated. And some patients have to have treatment for up to a year before you get the full benefit. Oh, wow. So for some, it can be a long-term treatment. But say, do look at Martin Lerner's work because I just but based my um, treatments on, on his experience and his publications. Thank you so much. You mentioned ME there, Sarah, and this last case that I think we have time for today um, in the last 10 minutes is um, initially was uh, termed ME. So I'll just read a few pointers from it. Um, I first developed ME CFS in 2007 at age 37 after becoming increasingly exhausted and run down over the previous six to nine months. I recall having had a mild flu-like illness in the summer of 2006 and returning to work too soon. I left the job in 2009 due to continued exhaustion. Um, this pattern continued of, of huge uh, post-exertional malaise until autumn 2022, where I pushed myself too much and um, basically now she's uh, forced to uh, be bed bound, chair bound uh, mm. due to her orthostatic hypertension and severe fatigue. So I won't read all the markers that she's given us, but um, this is being termed very severe fatigue. And um, she says that um, um, while she has seen some benefit from pacing in the past, and from vitamin C, B vitamins, and CoQ10. Now, none of that really seems to help her at all. So she's wondering um, whether testing of any kind could be useful. She's never tested for infections, for example. 
Um, so we've got a bit of a sort of clean slate here to just, you know, put forward a few ideas maybe. Well, my, the overall strategy for treating ME, uh, because ME, of course, is not a diagnosis, it's a clinical picture. We have to ask the reason why. And if she has post-exertion malaise, then that means she has pathological fatigue. So pacing, she might not think it's working, but it's absolutely vital. And this is why graded exercise is such a disaster in these people. But I would first look at energy delivery mechanisms. And as you know, the analogy I like to use is the car analogy. So you've got to have the, you know, the, the right diet, which is the fuel in the tank. You've got to have oxygen, which is all about correct breathing, good mitochondrial function, and then the control mechanisms, the thyroid accelerator pedal, and then the adrenal gearbox. And if she has ME, then that means she has symptoms of inflammation. And we then have to ask what's driving that inflammation. And it's going to be chronic infection, it's going to be allergy, it's going to be autoimmunity. And at that point, allergy tests, well, I don't think allergy tests um, are sufficiently accurate to be of much use. There are too many false positives and too many false negatives. So allergy you work out with good detective work and elimination dieting, maybe even starting with a carnivore diet. Uh, and then, yes, infections, um, this is where the arming tests are so helpful because that gives us an idea of the infectious load and which microbes are there. And then I put in place general interventions to reduce the um, total load and then specific interventions if indi indicated. So that's the overall treatment in, in you know, a minute and a half. Um, uh, <laughs> I could talk all day about this, as, as many know. And what I do do, which some people find helpful, is I do all day Zoom workshops and I have 20 people and I just talk all day. I'm doing a, day, a session tomorrow. So if you'd like to join that, it costs 40 quid for the day. So um, not that I'm trying to advertise myself. It's a very good way of, of hearing from the horse's mouth what, what wants to be done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Armin and just Anita, any final words on, on, on the syndrome that you've just heard about? Yeah, uh, Armin, a perhaps a few tests that you think could be useful to for the chronic fatigue, uh, ME, this is always yeah. the same. We find the EBV of Shabar virus, we find the cytomegalovirus, we find the herpes simplex yeah, virus, virus, find varicella zoster yeah. virus, we find HHV6, which is a typical chronic and ME yeah. virus. Yeah. We find also the gut viruses, Coxsackie, Echovirus, so virus, virus, virus. Not to say that Lyme disease patients have the same problem, okay? Uh, mm. We have also chlamydia, mycoplasma, the bacterial world, we have the parasites, all of these suck our energy. And um, But I think the viruses, um, they are really yeah. like aliens. They, they suck our mitochondria completely empty, and then we have the problem. Mm. And um, it, it's also lymphatic, what I want to mention, the, the first system, case, what yes. we forgot to discuss. Um, these are lymphotropic viruses. They live in the mm. lymph nodes. Mm. They live in the liver. They live in the spleen. How can you detox? It's blocked. You cannot detox because lymphatic system is blocked. Some need lymphatic drainage. It's sometimes a good idea. And, and also lymphomyosis, what you're using. So we have options um, to bring it out. But um, we need to, what Sarah, exactly you said, we need to reduce the viral load. Otherwise, we don't come forward. And maybe we really need a virus statics. Why mm. not use virus statics? And this could be also... Yeah, uh, after doing testing, yeah, doing uh, testing of the top ones, maybe using your checklist to this find out what it is. Model. This yeah. is not one infection fits all, one pill fits all. We need individualized. We need to know what to treat. Uh, otherwise, we are attacked. You know, um, it's the same with the vaccination. We have patients; they don't have any problems with vaccination. But what I see in the vaccination, an overboost of IgA antibodies. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. how, how how much IgA they produce? You cannot imagine. IgA is not normal. It's inflammatory. Yeah, it's mucosal. Yeah. So it's a massive inflammation of the spike protein, whatever it is. Uh, the expression, we have overproduction. We, we come again, what Leona said, to autoimmune disorders. We need to be absolutely careful in overboost. Mm. There I yeah. agree you, Sarah. Uh, we, are, we should not overboost the people who have enough titers. How, where do you want to go with your titer, mm. whatever you're doing? Um, so we need to be immunology. Immunology is very, very important, and we forgot about this. And again, the gut, I think we are yeah. completely agree with that. Um, these patients you mentioned, they nearly all had problems with the gut, all the UME patients. Mm -hmm. It's a holistic approach, and I'm very happy that, Sarah, you are here, so um, that you are staying for that concept, and you got attacked from NHS for that. 
but I think this is the key um, to help really the people. It's it's not not just to give uh, some chemical drugs, you know, some mm. against the headache, against uh, uh, the pain. Um, uh, and what a lot of doctors doing, where we we disagree now in this um, anti-inflammatory side, it's okay the corticosteroids, and you cannot imagine how bad they are for our immune system. Additionally. Mm to the infections, to the immune, to mm -hmm. the stress factors. Everything is stress triggered for sure. We agree with that. Yeah, so we need to reduce uh, now the guidelines <laughs> um, coming not to, um, to recommend uh, immune suppression. We need to build up our immune system. And what we are doing now, medical lockers, we destroy it. That's not, yeah. not the way for yeah. Yeah. If I could yeah, just no, add one. Yeah, I mean, yes, please do, Leona, yes. As a non-clinician, but as a scientist and, and reading these case reports, it's all about the immune system to begin with. If you, if you don't know what status or fitness level the immune system is, how in the world can you think that you're going to treat something or take care of it? You have to think the immune system and and really try to to boost it well that's what the literature you know advises and and this is what many clinicians advise is it's it's really immune system that's the lead of course immune system is a lot about you know markers and stuff like biomarkers but it's also symptoms too so it's we really really need to take care of the immune system yeah absolutely Oh, well, thank you so, so much, everyone. I think probably we don't have time for another case, though I do have another couple too. So let's make sure that we do this again. And um, if we could please copy over the chat, because I, though I haven't had time to read all of it, I know that fascinating exchanges were going on there. Yeah. Maybe um, this time we could actually type out some of it and put it underneath the recording and have it there, a bit like uh, Professor uh, Lambert, kindly typed out all his answers to the questions that he got. Uh, I think this chat probably deserves to be, uh, you know, spread a little bit more widely. So we'll consider that. And um, thank you everybody for being there. Thank you for all your questions and um, everyone who submitted cases, thank you. We'll let you know a bit more in advance the next time we do this so that we get a few more cases and um, we'll maybe spread the net a bit wider and cover some other types of syndromes as well. I know Armin, if people are prepared to wait for just five minutes more, you had something to say about eczema and psoriasis that had specifically been requested. Yes, Is that something one, you can fit into just a few minutes? One patient Remember of Remember you mentioned psoriasis and you had some uh, thoughts yes. about that because you've been asked about it. That was one, one patient, so I need uh, your advice, Sarah, uh, huh. what to do with this psoriasis patient and how to help this patient. Well, psoriasis has many fungal associations. Uh, and if you Google psoriasis and yeast and fungi, you get a whole host of references coming up. But I'd love to direct you to a wonderful paper um, of six patients with severe psoriasis, and they were treated with high dose vitamin D up to about 30,000 IU daily. Now at that mm. level, you have to keep an eye on the serum calcium for obvious reasons, but they all responded extremely well to that. So it's a very simple intervention. And of course, we all know, you know, the topical treatment for, for psoriasis is calcipotriol, which is the synthetic form of vitamin D mm. that's supplied directly to the lesions, but taken systemically, very inexpensive, very effective, but I say, do check the uh, uh, serum calcium. That's fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Well, we'll maybe go on to sort of skin type uh, disorders next time as well. So thanks uh, to our wonderful panel again, and thank you to all our attendees. And we'll get this out as a recording to you very soon. It'll be on our website under past webinars. Thanks a million. Thank bye you, Gillian. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye.